I was a 16-year-old girl, trapped in the monotonous grind of my part-time job at Chuck E. Cheese's. Each shift seemed to stretch on forever, dragging me deeper into a world of cheesy pizza and shrieking children. But one day, as the hands of the clock inched toward the end of my shift, something sinister began to unfold. Into the fluorescent-lit haven of Chuck E. Cheese's, a man walked in, accompanied by two seemingly innocent little boys. At first glance, there was nothing unusual about them. I went about my duties, my forced smile ready to serve pizzas and entertain kids, as if on autopilot. Little did I know that this seemingly ordinary day would turn into a nightmare. Gradually, an unsettling aura enveloped the restaurant, and it all emanated from that man. His presence seemed to cast a shadow over everything. His eyes, dark and smug, followed me like a predator tracking its prey. Every time I walked past his table, he greeted me with a sinister, Ola, a greeting dripping with malice. Though he clearly didn't speak English, his intentions were terrifyingly clear. My discomfort grew with each passing moment, but I tried to dismiss it as mere paranoia. After all, what harm could he possibly do in a place filled with families and children? But as the day wore on, I couldn't ignore the nagging sense of dread that had settled in the pit of my stomach. It was when I was cleaning a table, lost in my thoughts, that I stumbled upon his horrifying secret. I noticed him holding his phone, its camera pointed directly at me, recording my every move without consent. Panic surged through me, my heart racing as I realized I was being filmed against my will. I froze, our eyes locking in a tense standoff. He scrambled to conceal his phone, but the damage was done. I had seen his vile act, and I knew I had to confide in my managers and co-workers. Surely, they would intervene, protect me from this stalker who had invaded my world. But when I shared my fears with them, their reactions chilled me to the bone. They brushed aside my concerns as if they were inconsequential. It's not a big deal, they insisted, urging me to simply stay away from him. Desperate to escape his predatory gaze, I tried to put as much distance as possible between us. However, it seemed as though he had become an omnipresent specter, always lurking in the shadows just beyond my field of vision. No matter how many times I turned around, he was right there, his eyes locked onto me with unwavering malevolence. I found refuge behind the counter, huddled in the tiny space it offered, my heart pounding in my chest. It was there that I waited, praying for the moment when he would finally depart and release me from his sinister grip. But this was far from over. I couldn't shake the feeling that his intentions were far more malevolent than mere harassment. It was as if he were plotting something darker, something that sent chills down my spine whenever I dared to think about it. I believed he deserved to be kicked out of the restaurant, at the very least. Yet, my pleas fell on deaf ears, my managers dismissing my concerns as if I were a naive child. As the days passed, the air inside Chuck E. Cheese's grew heavier with an unspoken dread. I couldn't shake the feeling that this man's intentions extended beyond mere intimidation, that he was harboring a malevolent plan, waiting for the perfect moment to unleash a nightmare I couldn't even begin to fathom. Each shift became a descent into a deeper abyss of fear and uncertainty, and I knew that my life would never be the same again. My father and I were never close, and my lack of connection extended to anyone from his side of the family. His two younger brothers set off every internal alarm I had. Uncle Juan turned out to be an unsettling figure, with rumors circulating that he had touched his stepdaughter, whom he had raised since infancy. But it's Uncle too, whom I'll call D, who remains the haunting presence in my memories. Growing up, I had several siblings and many cousins in our small town. 
They all adored D, finding him to be the life of the party. But I couldn't shake the eerie vibes he gave off. I didn't trust him, and an unshakable feeling of dread kept me at a distance. My mother had never forced me to engage in physical contact with anyone, and I remained wary of D. D lived next door to my grandmother, who always seemed to be ailing. One day, I found myself staying with her while she prepared food for D, who was down with an illness. She handed me a plate of food and told me to take it over to him. I wasn't thrilled about it, but I knew better than to disobey. So, reluctantly, I carried the plate next door. Entering his house, I could feel the tension thick in the air. Dee's voice cut through the silence, instructing me to bring the food back there. I proceeded to his bedroom, placing the plate on a wardrobe at the foot of the bed. Dee's voice rang out again, more demanding this time. He insisted I put the plate on the nightstand next to his bed. As I did, Dee grabbed my arm, his grip cold and unyielding. Panic surged through me, and I desperately tried to free myself from his grasp. He began pulling me toward him, while I dug my foot against the nightstand, resisting with all my might. My voice quivered as I repeatedly pleaded, let me go. The room felt like a claustrophobic nightmare, and I was ready to do whatever it took to break free. Finally, he relented and released his grip on me. I fled from his house in a frenzied rush, my heart pounding in my chest. I said nothing to grandma, too shocked and frightened to find the words. Later that evening, I confided in my cousin, expecting her to share my terror. Instead, she dismissed my fears, calling me stupid. She couldn't fathom why I, the only one who didn't warm up to D, would react this way. She insisted he only wanted to talk. I felt an overwhelming sense of guilt for jumping to such sinister conclusions. I questioned my own judgment for a long time, wondering if I had been wrong in my reaction. But as I grew older and reflected on that haunting encounter, I realized that my reaction was justified. What kind of adult tries to coax a child into warming up to them by forcibly pulling them towards a bed? What kind of adult persists when they can clearly see the child's terror? D had passed away several years ago, and rumors of his inappropriate behavior with young girls had circulated, though nothing was ever proven. Despite the doubts and guilt that had haunted me, I remain convinced that my instincts had served me well in that unsettling moment. Over a decade has passed since the unsettling events I'm about to recount. Memories of that time are hazy, but the dread still lingers, as vivid as ever. This tale is no fabrication, every word is true. After reading countless spine-chilling stories on this platform, I felt compelled to share my own. My grandmother's residence lay nestled in the heart of our town's most notorious district, plagued by a relentless wave of shootings and drug-related horrors. Inexplicably, though, my childhood sanctuary was my grandmother's house, where I spent the majority of my early years. Even now, at the age of 81, she clung to that crumbling abode. My cousin, just a year my senior, and I were frequent visitors to our grandmother's, where we'd pass our days under her watchful eye. Aged between four and six, we were still forging the bonds of our friendship. Our mothers, forced to work, sought refuge in my grandmother's care. The visits blurred together in my memory, but they were numerous. During my grandmother's errands, a neighbor, an elderly woman we'll call, N, would watch over us briefly. Even when my grandmother was at home, N often dropped by, as if drawn by an invisible force. Her presence was comforting, she played with us, her demeanor unfailingly sweet. There was never a hint of impropriety, and my grandmother held her in the highest regard. Fast forward a few years, 
my cousin and I were now 9 to 12 years old. A new phase in our lives began when my grandmother started hosting sleepovers. Those nights were the zenith of our childhood, staying up late, indulging in forbidden treats, blasting music, and diving into video games. We were well aware of the dangers lurking beyond those walls. Our doors remained locked, curtains drawn tight against the malevolent world outside. To the left of my grandmother's dwelling, there resided an older gentleman, C, in the house adjacent to ours. My grandmother's warning about him was dire, she labeled him a sinister figure, a predator of children. Whenever my mother dropped me off, I'd glimpse him sitting on his porch, an ankle monitor strapped to his leg, like a prisoner under house arrest. What haunts me to this day is C's visage. As a child, my perceptions may have been skewed, but there is no doubt in my mind that his face was grotesquely deformed. Long, disheveled brown hair framed a visage that could only be described as a macabre distortion. One eye stood higher than the other, his forehead protruding grotesquely. His gait and speech were equally eerie, a low, grumbling voice reminiscent of a nightmarish character from The Goonies. Terrifying, this is what he was to me, even then. I was so frightened by him that, as a child, I instinctively sought refuge behind my mother whenever we approached my grandmother's house. On occasion, C would muster a friendly greeting, asking, how are you guys today? We, however, remained silent, refusing to acknowledge him. When we played in the backyard, his presence alone was enough to send us scurrying indoors. Our lives had been altered by this fear, forcing us to shun a person instead of enjoying the simple pleasures of our innocent years. My grandmother's vague warnings did little to quell our curiosity. She divulged that he touched little kids and had done bad stuff with them. As we grew older, we pieced together the horrifying blanks in her narrative. At the age of 12, we uncovered a peculiar development, N and C had become oddly close. This bewildering alliance, considering N's age and devout religiosity, had us questioning the sanity of our world. My grandmother severed ties with N when she discovered their growing rapport, forbidding her from further contact. N persisted, pleading with my grandmother, insisting that C had changed, that he was a new man. But my grandmother was unwavering. She would not expose us to a man who had once been labeled a child predator. Then, an unexpected twist, a call from N to my grandmother, requesting recent photographs of my cousin and me from school. She claimed to need updated pictures, hinting that she already had older ones of us from our younger days. My grandmother, her resolve unshaken, refused, citing C's frequent visits to N's residence. She also insisted on the return of any existing photographs in N's possession. Surprisingly, C found himself married, a decision that shattered our understanding of him. N reached out to my grandmother, seeking her blessing. My grandmother, in disbelief, could not comprehend the turn of events. Regardless, her stance remained unwavering. She knew her response wouldn't sway them, and so they wed and departed together. This twist was unsettling, altering our perception of N entirely. Now, at the age of 20, I find myself deeply troubled by her actions. I am left to ponder the mysteries of C, his deeds, the duration of his imprisonment, details that might have illuminated the shadows of this chilling tale. My curiosity, newly stoked, drives me to seek answers. Lucy's face, an unsettling mixture of fear and fascination, is etched indelibly in my memory. It's a peculiar comparison, but an apt one. Today, I am eternally grateful for my grandmother's unwavering protection. Her actions allowed my cousin and me to return to a semblance of normalcy, free from the shadow of constant surveillance and fear. 
We no longer needed to dread a potential intrusion in the dead of night or peering eyes at our windows. The enigmatic friendliness of C, the inexplicable alliance between him and N, and the chilling revelations that emerged over time continue to haunt my thoughts. The true current status of this unsettling duo remains shrouded in uncertainty, an uncertainty I intend to unravel, now that I've committed this eerie chapter of my life to words.